Hello and welcome back to AP World History and Modern. Today we're going to look at Unit 9.2, Technological Advances and Limitations after 1900, with an emphasis on disease. Our learning objective is to explain how environmental factors affect human populations over time. All right, so, we're going to do a little skill practice and do a little comparison today. And, uh, and uh, we're looking at disease. All right, so uh, I've actually never been more excited uh, to make a video. I can't wait to post this thing onto YouTube because I am just curious because I am going to mention the word COVID-19. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering if I'm going to get like a little flag or uh, you know, a little additional information bar on the bottom. Or, um, I'm going to be very disappointed if it, if it doesn't, but hopefully, yeah, maybe. I'm excited even making this video just thinking about it. All right, so uh, so yeah, so we're looking at um, you know, we kind of break down the the illustrative examples given to us by the College Board. Uh, diseases associated with poverty. Uh, obviously, we've already looked at malaria and cholera in the past, you know, and these are obviously still still diseases that are you know very much around today. Um, tuberculosis, right? You don't really see or hear about that very much in the United States anymore, but it is around. Um, I personally have been given a tuberculosis test before. Um, you know, it's kind of a very simple little test that they, you know, kind of poke your skin and look for a reaction. Um, so, but it is around, right? It is around today. You, you know, it is highly contagious. Um, going to be looking at epidemic uh diseases and really today that's what we're going to be talking uh, the most about is is these kind of emergent epidemic diseases and of course you know uh, being able to distinguish the difference between an epidemic disease a pandemic disease and an endemic disease all right so uh the 1918 you know spanish influenza or the 1918 influenza pandemic um you know that is a pandemic so it begins as an epidemic in the united states and then becomes a pandemic um, Ebola, right? Good example of a of an epidemic disease, right? So, you know, when we talk about epidemic diseases, we're referring to diseases that are kind of contained within a region, right? Uh, and of course, HIV, AIDS, um, you know, that is a that is an endemic endemic disease, right? That is a disease that is simply part of the human population at this point. So we'll kind of take a minute and look at all those. Um, I'm really not going to spend time on this. I know this was in your homework. So diseases associated with longevity, you know, as demographic shifts take place in the post-World War II world, uh, especially in the Western world, you know, as people begin to live longer, as average life expectancy goes from the low 60s to the mid 80s in some countries, you know, you're going to get, uh, these aren't new diseases, but these are diseases that you know did definitely happen previously. However, given in change of diets and increasing age demographics, uh, the uh, incidence of these diseases are going to be, or the prevalence of these diseases is simply going to increase. So it's not that Alzheimer's did not exist in the past. Uh, it's simply the you know, the number of individuals who who contract it or you know who uh, develop it. Probably a better way to put it. Um, has simply increased as more people live longer. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and kind of get started with this. All right, so here's an image from the Spanish flu. All right, so so some diseases that you probably don't know that much about uh, because we have vaccines for them. All right, so some of these are you know relatively new. You know, some of these we don't take in the United States. Um, I personally have taken the typhus vaccine. Uh, the way it was given to me was as uh, I was traveling into the Amazon basin, and before I left, um, I took the typhus vaccine. And it was given to me as a pill, right, in a, kind of like a liquid pill. Um, and it was a live virus, which means I was given a multi-dose, I think it was like four doses or five doses, I don't remember which. Uh, and I had to refrigerate them until I had taken the whole, the whole series. Um, so some of these are live viruses, right, and uh, some of these are are kind of more important than others as well. You know, when you look at when you look at viruses, right? We kind of look at um, you know obviously the the epidemic, pandemic, endemic part of it, but we also try to break down viruses. You know, you know as far as how we should approach them and 
And, uh, you know, and we, we base those kinds of decisions on things like transmission, right? Transmission, right? how transmissible is it? Um, you know, so the uh, one of the more significant factors that comes into play is, you know, uh, how is it spread? How transmissible is it spread only through body fluid contact? Uh, only certain types of body fluid contact? Can it be spread on surfaces? How long can the virus live on certain surfaces? Uh, is it airborne? Right. So, and can it be spread via, you know, via airborne? And, uh, and of course, when it comes when we talk about transmission, this is going to change how we view certain diseases. Uh, a disease like measles, right, is very, is very, very transmissible. One of the most transmissible, right, uh, transmissible viruses out there. You know, and, uh, and of course, most of you, you wouldn't be a student at our school if you didn't have the MMR vaccine. That's the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, all right? So and measles uh, out of those is the most transmissible. So transmission rates is one of the ways that we look at these kinds of things. Uh, one is demographics, right? And uh, when you look at demographics, some of these diseases impact, you know, different demographics in different ways. Polio was a really good example of a disease that really horrified a lot of people uh, because the demographic that was affected was young. It impacted children uh, at much higher rates than adults. You know, obviously, adults were affected as well. Obviously, FDR, our, you know, our former president in this country, he contracted polio in adulthood uh, you know, and lost, lost use of his legs. You know, but, you know, but polio is, uh, you know, is, is one that... You know, was was viewed differently because of the demographics that it impacted. Um, you know, so so transmission is a big deal when we kind of look at these viruses. Demographics is another one that's a very very big deal, and obviously mortality rates. Right. So you know why is you know why is Ebola such a scary thing? Uh, very high mortality rates. Um, you know, so we need to kind of look at, when you look at these viruses, whatever they are, you know, it's not just, you know, whether they are an epidemic or not, but also how are they transmitted and what is the transmission rates of them through that method? Uh, what are the demographics that are impacted by it? And of course, what are the, the overall mortality? So some important things to consider, right? Important things to consider. So when we look at, you know, when we look at different diseases that are out there, Right, so like take this this one for example, HIV. Right, people living with AIDS, HIV. Let me just kind of stop this for a second. When you look at the United States and, and HIV in the United States, um, you know, let's kind of zoom into where we live here. All right, so we are in right here on the coast of Georgia in Glynn County. All right, so we are a dark red area. Right, we are the worst. Right when it comes to how you know, however, this is being considered, um, right? So looking at 381 plus people per hundred thousand is is what is uh, these are all per hundred thousand rates. Okay, um, you know, so you know, we we live in one of the worst places, right? And, or at least the highest of these shaded categories. So. Technically, you can kind of start comparing these and you'll find that places in, like, for example, Metro Atlanta are three to four times higher than, than here. So, so maybe that might put your mind at ease a little bit. But, you know, in class, I'll always kind of ask, uh, you know, how many of you guys are sitting here losing sleep over HIV? You know, and because we are, we do live in a, in a HIV hotspot. You know, and generally the answer is nobody is losing sleep over this uh, because of, Right, not because of you know we, we, because of how you have to view these things, right? Remember transmission, demographics, mortality. I mean HIV. When you look at mortality rates, if it is untreated, the mortality rate for HIV rate, AIDS is one hundred percent, literally one hundred percent. I have never heard of any individual who contracted HIV and AIDS, didn't get any treatment at all, and survived it. Right, so a one hundred percent mortality rate. You would think if you live in one of the highest kind of rated, at least in, under this one, right, the dark red, um, you should be like freaking out about this and losing sleep over this, right? 100% mortality rate, and you live in a place where it's a hot spot. Uh, so why aren't you know why why aren't you know, 
you know, my students freaking out about this uh, because of method of transmission, right? So it's, uh, you know, it, it is spread by uh, body fluid contact and not even all types of body fluid contact. You know, kissing, so saliva is not going to, not going to spread it. Um, you know, so transmission makes a big, you know, makes a big deal with how we view and how we perceive a lot of these, a lot of these things. Right. So if we're talking about AIDS, right? AIDS is today, um, you know, HIV today is is not generally a feared thing. Uh, today we have a drug cocktail which will help prolong your life indefinitely. Um, you know, people, individuals who contract it, we can generally trace it to you know uh, some kind of uh, intravenous drug issue or you know unprotected sexual contact. Um, there are incidences of people contracting HIV um, through no fault of their own, you know, infidelity in relationships, uh, rape, um, you know, are, are a couple kind of common things that, you know, that you do hear about every once in a while. Um, you know, it's not like it was in the 80s, right? So uh, us, us people of a certain age right, who, came to, who came into uh, kind of adulthood in, in the late 80s and early 90s, um, you know, we are all, when we went through our high school health classes, we all watched the Ryan White story. Um, you know, and so HIV transmission was a very scary thing in the 80s, um, you know, back when blood was not being screened and, and who knows, maybe you had a childhood disease or maybe you just got into a car accident and you had to go and have surgery and have a blood transfusion. Um, you know, it, it was a scary thing. In, in the 80s because in, you know, people through no fault of their own were, were contracting HIV in AIDS and, uh, you know, and you know, it wasn't a, uh, you know, something that was happening in a super small percentage, it was happening. And uh, so, I mean, you still have some of that today, just much, much lesser numbers. So anyway, it's, it is important to understand transmission and, and mortality when you are looking uh, and of course, demographics. You know, when you're looking at these kinds of things, you know, when you're looking at Ebola, right? Ebola. Um, so this is a this is a disease that is a an epidemic disease, right? An epidemic disease. Um, you know, never kind of reached pandemic status, although it's been around for a decent amount of time. If you scroll up from where you're watching this or on the website, I do have a, a little Ebola kind of rundown, right? So first discovered in '76, we see how it is spread. Right, so you know when you compare it to HIV, the mortality rate, as you can see down here, the mortality rate is actually quite a bit lower, uh, considerably lower for Ebola than it is for HIV. However, the transmission rates are much much higher. Okay, so yes, blood and secretions or any kind of bodily fluid, um, you know, and on surfaces. Right, so. So uh, contaminated bedding, clothing, anything, right? Anything, even basic surface contact can result in transmission of Ebola. So highly transmissible. Um, however, right, why hasn't it made that jump from an epidemic disease, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to become a pandemic? Uh, because when we talk about transmission, yes, it is much more transmissible than HIV AIDS. However, it is not airborne transmissible, right? Like what we see with the 1918 flu outbreak, right? Which was an airborne, airborne disease. Okay, so there's there's a lot of different factors that you kind of need to weigh when you're looking at looking at this kind of these kinds of things, All right? So obviously Alzheimer's, right? So societies that are you know that are older. Um, have the have the highest or the oldest life expectancy um, are generally going to see much higher rates of Alzheimer's, obviously. All right, uh, diabetes, obviously, diet, obesity are contributing factors to this. Um, and I don't know why. I don't because I don't know enough about why heart disease is not. You know, I would think heart disease, or you'd think heart disease would be, you know, uh, more prominent in the United States. You know, than Know, some other countries that are that are darker red here so yeah i don't know enough about that one to, to actually give you a good claim as to as to why so all right let's uh, go ahead and get going all right so let's go ahead and read this real quick um you know and maybe try to do a little sourcing on this so i'm not obviously i don't have the source on this 
So let's just kind of read this real quick. Uh, the Board of Health closed schools and places of amusement and public gatherings. Churches were closed. An atmosphere of panic begins to set in. Nurse, uh, doctors and nurses were overworked. Hospitals were filled with capacity. Emergency hospitals were set up. Chief health officers uh, who had led the campaign to wear masks were convinced that lack of masks were the problem. Most refused official calls to resume their masks voluntarily. They were tired of wearing the uncomfortable things. Public health colleagues uh, were convinced that the masks had been responsible not once, but twice for saving San Francisco. Others, however, disagreed. State Board of Health officers cited statistics showing that strict mask wearing in Stockton, California had not prevented uh, a high death rate as high as found in Boston, where masks were hardly worn at all. All right, so if I were to ask you to contextualize this passage, like what, what uh, pandemic is this talking about? And right, what else is going on? Um, you know, I always kind of ask that of of, uh, of classmates or of, of students, uh, or the classmates who are who are in class today. And uh, and of course, you know, many will say that they you know they kind of assume this is COVID nineteen because this is what you're experiencing right now. Uh, but of course, this is uh, straight out of the straight out of the College Board resources uh, and documents on on the Spanish flu. All right, Spanish influenza outbreak or the 1918 influenza outbreak. All right, so it does kind of point, it does kind of bring up this thing where this is such a part of today's discussion um, that maybe there's a lot of similarities between understanding, you know, uh, the 1918 influenza outbreak and what what's going on currently um, with with COVID-19. Right, so it is kind of worth a minute to you know to, to kind of understand the the covid the spanish influenza's connection uh to covid 19 because maybe it'll help you understand it better so let's just go ahead and do a little venn diagram do a little similarities and differences so we'll start with the differences um so the spanish flu right spreads through soldiers returning home and going to war right um and of course uh you know so where does it originate the the uh you know we believe the the spanish flu doesn't originate in spain um, so maybe it shouldn't even be called the Spanish flu. Maybe that's why the College Board is calling it the 1918 influenza. Uh, maybe it should be called the United States influenza, right? So the American flu, um, or even the Kansas flu. I think Kansas is the is where it originated. I think it's like the first known case of it, um, right? So how does how does it spread? It spreads. Well, I mean, if you're trying to contextualize what's going on, uh, World War One is going on. Right, 1918 is uh, the last year of, of battle, of actual conflict during World War, World War One. And we see that outbreak initially get identified in the spring of 1918, and and uh, it gets identified at boot camps, right? Training army training facilities, and of course, you know, close contact with one another. Uh, it's an airborne virus, right? And and we see those soldiers moving from their from their conscription boot camps into the cities, you know, funneling into the cities and then going across the Atlantic overseas and they bring they bring the Spanish flu or the 1918 influenza uh, with them across the ocean to Europe. So so we see it spreading in the late spring and early summer of 1918. Right. And uh, and of course, as it makes its way through the through the front of both sides, uh, what happens you know, what happens in the late fall or mid to late fall of 1918, uh, the war ends, which means all of those South Asian soldiers, African soldiers, you know, I mean, the Japanese had soldiers in Europe, especially naval, a couple naval ships uh, in Europe. Um, all of those soldiers are then going to go home, right? So starts in the United States, goes to Europe, and then when the war wraps up six months later, it goes all over the world. So it you know, goes from being an epidemic disease in the United States to a pandemic, right? So it spreads through through soldiers traveling home. Uh, how does COVID-19 spread through international travel, right? So via commercial airliners, right? So, you know, business travelers traveling. Um, so the, the believed origination point of COVID-19 is in China. Um, you know, so we see, you know, tourists, 
um, tourists and business travelers and just family, you know, natural family travel uh, around the world, right? So, you know, in the, and of course, the, the, the places around the world that kind of had the closest relationship with the city of Wuhan in China, um, you know, there's a, you know, there are business connections between certain Italian cities um, in Wuhan, China, right? And then we're going to see initial outbreaks outside of China happening in places that have very close business connections, right? Medical connections. So the West Coast of the United States as well, all right? So, uh, right, so spreads, right, spreads via airfare, right, airliners, business travel, you know, interconnected medical knowledge, that kind of stuff, sure. All right, uh, news of the epidemic spread very slowly, all right, so why do we call it the Spanish influenza? This is kind of something we spent some time on in class, just kind of contextualizing this statement, um, or you know, trying to make sense of it. Uh, you need to understand that World War I is going on. And Spain is not involved in World War I, which means Spanish newspapers are simply reporting what they are seeing as it is happening. So the flu outbreak is happening, it's being reported on, right? So Spain becomes one of the only places uh, in Europe, right, that actually starts openly talking about this. Uh, so why doesn't the United States media publish this? Um, I guess you can go back to, you know, certain Supreme Court cases, maybe like Stank versus the United States, for example. Uh, but, you know, there was censorship, right, in place by the, you know, in place for the U.S. media during the war. Um, you know, and if you actually kind of look at some of the, you know, some of the actual reports coming from the U.S. Army in the summer of 1918, there are specific battles that were going on in July and August of 1918 where 60 to 80,000 American soldiers are sick, um, you know, taken off from the front lines. And, you know, so why was the media you know, blacked out on this topic? You do not want to telegraph, if you are in the middle of a war, that there is weakness. And, and uh, so it is, you know, to some degree understandable, right, because of the war, um, that, that news spreads very slowly, right? Um, with COVID-19, news of the epidemic spread pretty quickly. Um, you know, I remember first hearing about it in January of 2019. Um, I always, I asked today in, in class if uh, anyone, when the news came out that school was going to be, uh, um, you know, canceled for a couple of weeks, you know, when that announcement was made in mid-March of 2020, um, you know, I always ask, was that like a shock to anybody? Like, they didn't know why. Um, you know, was there a hurricane coming or something like, uh, did anyone have that thought? And so far, uh, nobody, you know, nobody has said yes to that. I don't know if they're not saying yes out of embarrassment, um, or they actually knew, but I, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine somebody being surprised by that decision. Um, you know, I think the latest someone has kind of admitted to first hearing about it was in February. Um, and it is kind of hard to make it through make it through February in this country without have heard about it or realizing the you know the way the, the way the tide was 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 moving. Um, all right, so news spread pretty quickly, right about this. Uh, doctors did not identify it at first, right? So kind of difficulty identifying it as a unique strain. And of course, uh, you know, doctors identified it quickly. Um, you know, and of course, we you know that's a pretty well covered story about the the doctor who did initially uncover it. Uh, and of course, we were able to identify the specific virus, you know, and map that pretty quick. Uh, but struggle to create a test, right? And when it comes to testing, uh, I think the last major change done to the test was done in January of 2021. Um, this is so. This is something that has been kind of fiddled with. Um, also, there were some kind of bureaucratic issues associated with kind of CDC permission uh, for private laboratories to be able to run these tests versus you know, officially sanctioned CDC labs. And so there's a, you know, there were some issues regarding testing in some countries. Uh, I believe other countries, you know, kind of cut through this much better than, than other countries. I think uh, South Korea uh, has been mentioned a few times, you know, as a kind of success story when it comes to testing. All right. Uh, when it comes to similarities, right? Similarities. Um, you talk about Spanish flu, right, uh, or COVID nineteen. Both of them have large fatality rates for specific demographics, right? And there, so there is a caveat there. 
Um, you know, Spanish flu, depending upon which variant of the, of the flu you're talking about, which wave of the virus you're talking about, um, you know, it does have decent fatality rates, kind of high fatality rates. Um, you know, uh, one difference with COVID-19 is, is what demographic it was. Uh, you know, Spanish influenza was, especially that second wave on, uh, generally seemed to affect uh, kind of late teens, early 20s. Uh, you know, younger populations, you know, the worst. Whereas with COVID-19, it's been pretty consistent throughout which demographic has been, has been uh, you know, kind of most impacted by this. All right. Uh, and I do have a, a slide that kind of looks that way. Uh, negative economic impact, right? Obviously, there's been a, a negative economic impact associated with this. Um, you know, this is part of the narrative for the 1918-1919. You know, uh, you know, businesses back in 1918, you know, uh, complained about the masks, wanted to do away with the masks because they were afraid the masks were going to hurt their Christmas sales and scare people. And, uh, and they were worried about Christmas season, shopping season, you know, and so stores, anytime when you're talking about closing down businesses, um, you know, you're going to have negative impacts. Of course, in the United States, uh, I mean, our government alone has spent more money on COVID-19 than we did all of World War II. Uh, wrap your mind around that one, right? And that's not even talking about the the, the tax impacts of shutting down, uh, you know, the entire country largely shut down um, for a couple of weeks, and then some parts of the United States are still not even fully open to this day, if, um, which is uh, hard to believe if you live in certain parts of the country that, that places aren't in fact open. Um, you know, so the major negative economic impact. Now, also information face censorship, right? So obviously because of the war, uh, the Spanish flu is going to face censorship and that's why we call it the Spanish flu, right? So censorship is going to be a major part of the story for that one because of the war. Um, you know, when you talk about COVID-19, you, know, uh, you know, most people are familiar with, with the, uh, the story of the doctor who first called attention to COVID-19 in Wuhan, China. Um, you know, what happened to him, you know, his, uh, his reporting it to the, the government officials in, in the city of Wuhan, him being questioned by the police about doing that, and, and uh, you know, what happened, what happened to him, what he was directed to do by the police, um, and then, of course, um, what happened to him after that, or afterwards, right? So, so he, uh, anyway, so there is initial censorship coming out of China. There's also reports that the first, uh, you know, all the samples of COVID-19 from patients from that first wave, um, you know, they are not available to Western countries. Some have uh, theorized that they were all destroyed by the Chinese government. Um, right, so censorship has definitely been a, an issue, right, in the kind of early days of it. Uh, and I guess most recently, the WHO had gone into China, you know, and, and tried to kind of do a, an origination tracing, where does, you know, where does it come from, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that report came out very recently and has largely been denied or at least kind of rejected by the Biden administration uh, because of the, you know, the conditions that were placed on the WHO team uh, by China. Um, so the credibility of that report has been already coming, as I called into question by the Biden administration. Uh, so information, right, is facing censorship um, in China, right? But I guess it's also important to note, since you, know, you have lived through this, that in the United States, we have also seen a lot of censorship regarding COVID-19, right? And uh, so we'll kind of talk about that as, as well, right? So, um, you know, so... An issue that is kind of a new issue, right, for the United States, not seen in about 90 years. All right, uh, so explain one similarity, one difference. Yeah, maybe. Not, not that hard to do. Okay. All right, uh, you know, before we kind of get into the Spanish flu, I'm going to take a few minutes to kind of get through this. And uh, and I guess you'll know when I come to Spanish, Spanish flu. So if you want to skip by this COVID-19 stuff, you're more than welcome to. But uh, there, there's you know, generally a lot of curiosity amongst students about this. So I do want to just kind of talk about this a little bit and try to be non-political about it. Um, and I will say when, when historians try to make sense of, of COVID-19 in the future, there's going to be no shortage of data out there for them to look through. 
And I think it's and it's an important thing that that maybe historians do a better job exploring COVID-19 than they did with the Spanish flu, because the exact same debates and the exact same uncertainties that existed during the Spanish flu came up in COVID-19, and we didn't have a clear definitive answer. So maybe this is an area of research that probably does need a more, more attention. Um, that being said, um, I can't imagine any, you know, uh, you know any you know, non-biased um, research being done right in the next couple of years. The issue is so political at this point. So I think we kind of need to get a little bit of distance uh, between now and then, right? But when that day does come, right, when, when the time does come, there's massive quantities of data out there to kind of look at COVID-19. Uh, internationally, of course, you know, within the States, right, within the United States, you know, tons and tons of data um you know and of course internationally as well um you know generally we look at this and kind of you know I'll, I'll pause this on here for a minute ask students to make a you know identify something here that uh that you may want to make a claim about um you know so go ahead and have a look at this for a second you know and, uh, and there's a lot to a lot to kind of grapple with there's a ton of information here just by looking at this but the first thing students usually mention because it is labeled is this number right here um you know so so i asked students to make an assertion about this and and uh so if you want to kind of go ahead and do that that's fine right i'm gonna guess if you did it at home that you are if you paused it and did it at home uh that you probably came up with something similar to what my students did is that because of censorship um you know from the chinese government then the numbers are you know are, are definitely wrong and etc 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 um all right so um i did have one student one student today who did come up with a different claim um who said who knows maybe you did it at home as well you got this one um one student came up with a claim that because of the severe um you know severe uh, uh measures taken by the chinese government to quarantine their population uh, that resulted in the ability to contain the virus, right? Um, and of course, for evidence of that, you would talk about them literally like, you know, making it illegal to walk your dog outside, um, you know, nailing people into their houses, like literally boarding people into their own houses. Um, yeah, so you could definitely make an, make an assertion that way. And who knows, maybe, uh, you know, we are not, we are, we're a little too close to this right to really objectively right kind of determine whether or not this is just censorship or not so maybe there is something to that assertion um maybe you know this is just kind of other ways of maybe looking at it maybe the way in which statistics are calculated in china are different than the rest of the world maybe these are covid 19 deaths with no comorbidities right because uh, the CDC back in the back in the fall, right back in the fall of 2020, they did release a breakdown of of COVID-19 deaths um, and did identify the number of comorbidities. You know, so if you look at deaths in the United States with zero comorbidities, then that number is not that far off uh, from China's. Right. So you know, when you look at this number here, the average number of comorbidities with that number. Uh, is over two, right? So, so uh, who knows? Maybe it is a statistical accounting thing a difference that actually you're comparing apples and oranges, right? That might be part of the story. Um, you know, so there's a there's a ton of. And by the way, I'm I'm pulling this off from the Financial Times of London. Okay, uh, if you're kind of wondering what the what the source of this of this is, right? So, so uh, yeah. So, but it, the point being, historians are going to have a ton of information to kind of go through and also to wade through, all right? So, because there are reasons why censorship might be a reason, all right? So, I, I just kind of threw this together based on a. It's actually based on an, an article I read uh, from I believe the Intelligencer uh, is where I got this from. Right is is uh because I, I think it did a, the article did an excellent job kind of breaking down some of the major things that need to be considered as we reflect upon COVID nineteen right one being the role of the media right what was the role of the media and this is kind of an interesting quote 
Um, right. So from a, this is from a British uh, professor. Uh, if you read the national press from any country, be it Germany or Switzerland or France, whatever, there's a strong feeling in most places that actually the situation is the worst locally. It kind of goes on to say these narratives of national crisis. So no matter where you are in the world, it is worse where you live than anywhere else. And no matter where you live in the world, it is a national crisis. Um, you know, what is the role in the media at creating and perpetuating this narrative at in driving uh, public policy? You know, uh, you know, is there is there a factor there? Is there, you know, this is kind of one of those, you know, this is kind of one of those situations where a panic has been created. You know, maybe it's not a moral panic quite as bad as what we see with the Cultural Revolution in China. Um, you know, but there is a certain bit of panic narrative that get, has been created. And do you want to be seen as an outlier? Um, you know, and uh, when it comes to what you are doing in your country or in your state, and you know, uh, so what? What was the role of media, right, by doing this in driving public policy? All right, um, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, social media censorship, right? This is something else I think is, I personally believe that this is going to eventually make its way through the courts. Uh, so this is actually from a, an, an excerpt from a Supreme Court ruling from 1927 um, from Whitney versus California, right? If there be time to expose through discussion the falsehoods and fallacies to avert the evil by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. There was a tradition in this country, in the United States for the past 90 years, that if you are concerned with what people are saying, um, you think someone might be throwing out false narratives, the way to correct that is not through censorship, but through more free speech. You know, kind of the, the, I guess, the most recent example of this is like with the, you know, the so-called anti-vaxxer movement. If you want to combat people who are against vaccines, you know, and taking regular vaccines, you know, and, uh, and of course, there was a ton of stuff about this in the late 90s and early 2000s. You know, what is the best way to combat? Do you censor those individuals? Or should you simply allow more free speech, um, allow the marketplace of ideas to exist, and allow the best arguments to win? So there's been a tradition in the last 90 years of our country to allow the marketplace of ideas to be free and, and allow free and open debate to be unrestricted. Okay? Uh, what we've seen in the last year and a half is a changing of that. Okay, so what is clear, and so this is from, uh, you know, from, from that exact same article that I'm pulling almost most of this from, um, you know, is, is that the governments of various countries have either attempted to find a solution to this issue or to use the possibility of censorship by big tech companies for their own purposes. And I guess I should just show you the source just so that you have seen it. Um, and actually, this is a, a different one. This is actually from a different, different source. Um, I pulled this from, uh, this is actually from the periodicals, All right? So, so yeah, talking about so, uh, censorship on social media, social media platforms, okay? Um, all right, so, so yeah, when you're, when you're looking at, you know, kind of looking or when, when uh, academics look back upon uh, the year 2020, um, you know, there's there's definitely going to have to be some attention paid to it. I personally believe that this will work its way through the courts. So I obviously have no idea what the Supreme Court would eventually rule about what happened this this last year. Um, you know, with Google, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Um, you know, I have no idea what's going to happen, but I do know that doctors, medical doctors, ER doctors, uh, you know, had posted information out there on on uh, YouTube. Right, shared that kind of stuff on Facebook and on Twitter, um, where they were, you know, going through what they were seeing and discussing what worked and what didn't work. And, and I know some of that stuff was counter to the prevailing, um, 
you know, the prevailing uh, narrative, right, of the day. And I know that Google did take those videos down, right, off from YouTube. I know Facebook did block them and take them down, and Twitter did take them down. So, um, you know, this this censorship, right, of of ideas. Um, you know, I'm going to assume that this is going to have to be dealt with probably through the courts, but it'd be interesting for, you know, for, for academics to, in the future to kind of look at that. Um, as far as the policies, right? So these policies that get put into place um, as a result of COVID-19, and this I think is probably the most important thing that academics deal with is, is uh, you know, we need to understand what actually worked and what actually didn't. You know, if you're just talking about the United States, Hawaii was notable, um, you know, in, in, their, you know, in their fatality rates, right? Almost no excess mortality. Um, however, I think there needs to be some, uh, some better understanding of why California, which had some of the most draconian lockdown measures and longest lasting lockdown measures in the country, um, you know, had uh, had higher death rates, had higher mortality rates in the state of California, uh, Florida, which uh, which has really been wide open since since May. Um, you know, they were shut down for a couple of weeks, and that was it. You know, so uh, and of course, you know, some of the uh, you know you know kind of you know get into this counter arguments. Florida actually has an older population, so that doesn't make sense. Uh, they are similar climatically. They are similar in population. Um, you know, as far as urban populations and density, both have major cities. Um, you know, it's uh, that is that is something that is going to take some research to, to kind of get to the bottom of. Um, you know, because based on current narratives, it doesn't make sense. So, and. Uh, and I think we kind of live in a time where these things should be able to make sense. Other kind of factors, right? Demography, right? Obviously, younger countries because of the, the demographic impacts of COVID-19, um, right? Distributions of comorbidities throughout populations, right? So, right, this is, yeah, I think this is largely understood already, but I think some kind of, you know, I, I think some, there are some outlier things out there uh, that, that are still a little uh, you know, counterintuitive with this, but like things like obesity, right, uh, diabetes, and stuff like that. Uh, geography, obviously, islands, right, face an advantage, um, and uh, and of course, you know, there are some kind of kind of some places that you know that have fared really well that aren't islands, like for example, Western Australia, the state of West Australia. Um, you know, I had a. Uh, you know, I, I've been seeing social media posts by families and friends that I have out in West Australia uh, all, you know, all year. And I, I would see pictures from like August and September of massive stadiums full of people with no masks and, and uh, you know, largely living, living a normal life. You know? And uh, so how were they able to do that, right, given the fact that they're not an island? Um, I guess an argument could be made that they are basically an island since Perth is literally the most isolated city on planet Earth and there's a massive desert um, separating uh, that city with the nearest city. So, so I mean, but these borders and, and the ability to control your borders, right, is, uh, seems to be a major part of, of this story, right? But also, um, you know, latitudes. You know, latitude maybe is a big thing. Altitude might be a thing. I mean, Peru and Bolivia fared pretty poorly, right? Um, you know, Ecuador, you know, pretty poorly. Ecuador, Peru, and then you know, those are near the equator, you know, on the equator, right? In, in the case of Ecuador, you know, Brazil, right? Brazil uh, fared pretty poorly as well. So, yeah, there's a, there are some kind of things that are, that, you know, kind of are kind of, kind of factual. Uh, country relationship to its borders, uh, climate. Right, so there is an appearance that humidity and temperature uh, help, right? But there's also plenty of examples where that wasn't the case, right? So um, this hygiene hypothesis, right? So this is kind of one one thought out there, and of course, this is also provides a lot of the counter arguments against some of the measures that were taken. Um, you know that you're actually kind of putting people at more risk, right? Certain cultural forces. Right. I know having lived in New York for a decent part of my life, that uh, cheek kissing is a, a common common thing in New York. So maybe that's part of the contributing factor 
uh, to why things were initially right, uh, different in New York. Although it's hard to kind of imagine that, I guess, with considering all the news. Right. And then a bunch of whole whole bunch of other stuff, you know, that that are going to be uh, kind of dealt with. Right. And, and examined by future historians. But we do have these kind of counterpoints and kind of factual. Right. Japan is old. Right. Uh, did not do much of a walk down yet. Fared pretty well. Uh, Brazil, you know, relatively young, massive, uh, tropical, you know, majority of it's in a tropical area. Uh, still did pretty poorly. Uh, England is an island. But they were unable to, you know, to to prevent uh, it from being widespread. And there's also a lot of talk about air, you know, being spread in the air, um, you know, and uh, you know, and of course, France is one of the worst outbreaks in in Europe. Um, and if you've ever, you know, been a tourist in France in the summertime, um, you probably know that air conditioning is a luxury that you know most hotels don't even have. Um, you know, I'm not sure, I guess, in a, in a major Paris hotel, um, you know, but definitely not within, you know, the kind of average person's house, right? Not central air there, um, or school, right? So there's, there are a lot of kind of counterpoints and kind of factuals. Um, all right. So I'm just going to scroll through these really quick because a lot of people are interested in this stuff. And, and, uh, I've, I've just been kind of keeping track of, of some kind of, a couple of memes, but mostly like news stories and stuff like that, uh, that have been out there. And so if you want to kind of skip past all these, you're more than welcome to. Um, you know, so probably going to take another five or ten minutes. So feel free to skip this. But uh, but this is from yesterday, right? This is from yesterday because I'm recording this on April 14th. Um, you know, and uh, so this is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, has been halted. So I don't know, maybe they'll resume it today. Maybe they'll resume it tomorrow. Um, it seems to be only an issue with women, so maybe they'll resume it for men today or tomorrow, or not for women while they study it more. Um, I will say that this is this is not the first time that this issue uh, has been talked about. Um, you know, this is uh, something that did pop up in the trial um, of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, um, and I guess it's uh, you know, I guess the the thing that makes this notable isn't the fact that um, that it's you know, being covered in the news, um, but it, but none of this stuff has been covered in the news. I think is kind of an important thing to to point out. Um, I guess the in uh, watching the Today Show this morning, um, you know, there was that they were interviewing interviewing Dr. Fauci, and I kind of found the question the most interesting thing to him. Um, and uh, the the question that was asked of him was, is is uh, putting a temporary halt on this vaccine? Uh, you know, is there a danger that you are giving anti-vaxxers uh, ammunition or if, you know, obviously paraphrasing what she was talking about? But the idea behind it was, you know, maybe you shouldn't have done this because you're going to give credence to anti-vaxxer discussions. Um, once again, um, more knowledge, not less. Right. And uh, that doesn't seem to be the case with with modern media. They seem to want to they seem to be comfortable, apparently with holding back knowledge in order to, you know, in order to maintain the direction in which they think things should be going. Um, you know, but I, but I think, I actually think Fauci's answer was a really good one here. Um, when he was asked that question, you know, he said, if anything, the halting of this should give credibility to, to the FDA, right? That they are willing to look at the information and act accordingly and appropriately. Um, yeah, I think he had a pretty answer, actually. And, uh, I think the question being asked by the reporter was the scary thing. Um, so that was kind of a good thing. Um, I guess I'm saying this just, you should know, I have had the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. My wife just had it a week ago. Um, you know, so uh, obviously this is news that we are following, right, pretty pretty closely. Um, all right, so other kind of news lately, right? So this is from the CDC website. I'm not going to read through all of this, but just to kind of point out, this is from April 5th of 2021. Um, that said, this article is largely about how COVID-19 is spread, specifically looking at primary mode in which people are affected is through exposure to respiratory droplets, possibility for people to be infected through contact with contaminated surfaces, objects, right? There is a, there is a chance, there is a possibility, but it's generally considered to be low, right? And then if you kind of scroll down to that article, 
Uh, here's a later paragraph, and of course, the, the thing that I want to highlight here is how low is it? All right, so pretty low. All right, so that just kind of came out very recently, right, by the you know, by the CDC, uh, and they also right. So back in March, they did reduce the uh, social distancing down from three feet or down to three feet, uh, which it was six feet, and this puts it in line with what the e, uh, the Europeans version of the CDC, the ECDC, um, this puts us in line with the recommendation made by them back last summer. All right, so they've been recommending one meter since the summer of 2020. Um, this is an important thing to kind of point out as well. Um, for all of my students who are watching this, if you are, you know, if you're out today, um, you know, obviously you remember the COVID shuffle, right? So because of the six feet requirement or the, uh, so, you know, in order to not have you guys all, you know, be quarantined, you know, we did the COVID shuffle, right? We set the uh, timer for 13 to 14 minutes, and then we all got up and we shifted around, and uh, you know, and we played the game, right? And uh, you know, in order to minimize quarantines, you know, and uh, and I guess I could talk more about that, but I probably should give a little bit more time. Um, but yeah, so once this happened, right, I've now changed my desk configuration because we don't have to do the COVID shuffle anymore. Um, and why are we even doing the COVID shuffle? um you know i mean obviously you, know, you gotta you gotta play the game right you gotta if you want to be in school so you gotta you, know, you gotta follow the rules and the rules said six feet right for 15 minutes or more right so that was that was basically the threshold for quarantining students so as long as you didn't sit within right closer than six feet um for 15 minutes or more then you were fine. Um, you didn't have to quarantine if that person you were sitting next to developed COVID-19. Um, so that's why we did the COVID shuffle. Right? That's why the COVID shuffle was a, uh, you know, was a thing in the, you know, in the fall and, and even early spring. Uh, I should also kind of note here: I've got thirty students in my class. Um, you know, since August, right? We've been here five days a week uh, since August, making this work. So. You know, of course, we do whatever we can do to get our kids in school, right? So whatever it has to be done to have our kids face to face in school, that was the uh, decision we made. Um, and I, of course, wholeheartedly stood by that, right? Uh, and of course, one of the reasons why I stood by this is I was consuming massive amounts of news, like out of the EU, right? I was looking at what the EU was saying. I saw the EU had that one meter, three feet recommendation, which is why I thought the Kobe shuffle was fine, right? Um, right so 6th of august you know i mean it was very clear right coming out of the eu you know you feel free to pause and read this kind of stuff i do blow up a couple of things it was very clear right coming out of the eu because they did not shut down schools um right in the in the spring like the united states did not for as long they, you know, some did some countries did for a week or two and then they resumed right and so the research was really clear coming out of the eu by summertime that a students were uh, you know students were not um, a primary driver of the spread of COVID nineteen um, right no evidence of any transmission right this was also coming out of the United States from our summer school programs as well in the summer um, and of course you know this uh, you know this idea of uh, of adults transmitting it to you know to uh, to children the children to adults just nothing. Right, there was the evidence was pretty clear by summer that schools should be open. Um, you know, schools should be open, right? And uh, you know, there's also, you know, I remember watching the summer of the Today Show, uh, when they had the pediatricians on, right? And from the pediatrician's point of view, it was a no brainer. Um, you know, when it comes to when it comes to demographic mortality, children are not at risk. When it comes to the research by the summer of 2020. Um, the transmission research was clear as well, right? Children were not transmitting it to adults. Um, teachers were not transmitting it to their students, right? It was very clear by the, you know, by the summer, right? So, so keep in mind, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of blowing these dates out of the water, right? I mean, I'm blowing them up a little bit because I do want you to see this headline. Chicago Teacher Union prepares for possible walkout Wednesday over reopening plans. High school staffs would refuse to work in person. This is from April 15th, 
This is literally from, oh, I did the date on that wrong. Sorry, April 13th. I knew it was one day, one day difference from today. Um, you know, let me, uh, I'll have to go back and change that. So that's from April 13th, 2021. Um, you know, so this is this is going to be hard for my students, right? This is kind of hard for you guys to under to wrap your mind around this. Um, I show this to the kids in class, and they just don't get it. Um, you know, the the data is pretty clear. We've been five days a week since August. How is it that there are still schools that are not back? You know, back um, based on all the all the knowledge that we currently have. Um, you know, this is stuff that's going to have to be kind of understood, right? And uh, when you look at chances of, of death for under COVID-19. So I'm just going to run through some information. I'm not even going to pretend to be able to understand this information. So uh, once again, stuff that researchers are going to have to kind of look at and try to make sense out of. You know, I don't, I don't understand data enough to, to grapple with what we're seeing here. All right, WHO, let's just have plans. This is that, that COVID, uh, this is that WHO investigation. And once again, I'm just gonna kind of skim through just stuff I pulled. It's actually in kind of reverse order. So it kind of starts with, you know, yesterday, and then I'm kind of moving back in time, um, you know, kind of looking at the relationship between, between in-person instruction, um, you know, in out-of-person instruction. I will say, because I live just north of Florida, right? So we get the Jacksonville news. I will say about Florida, um, you know, until early June, uh, individual school districts were coming up with their plans. And I know, like, because I get the Jacksonville news, I know the Jacksonville school district, they were talking about doing a hybrid schedule, like a two-day a week where kids come in and then two-day a week. Uh, they would have to do distance learning, and they were talking about that kind of stuff in in Florida. And then the governor came out in early July and said, "No, right? Every school district has to offer five day a week, a five day a week option." Um, that was a that was a requirement that the governor just he took what was being discussed and said, "No, that's not going to happen." Um, and kind of laid that out there. So Florida has literally been five day a week, um, full instruction since the beginning of this thing. Um, you know, in Georgia where we are, I don't think it's been that way ever. I think there are schools in Atlanta that probably were allowed, because I don't remember Kemp coming out and saying you had to offer the five day a week option. Um, you know, but our, our district did make that decision. We did delay for I think, a week and a half. Um, our opening in August, and then in mid-August, we opened up five days a week for any student who wanted to come. Um, right. So when you look at right, when you look at these uh, you know, in-person instruction versus rates of pediatric cases, right? So rates of pediatric cases here per hundred thousand. Um, obviously, whether or not you are in school or not in school has no impact. Um, you know, if anything, it actually might make uh, it might help. Um, and I kind of get this. Um, I have family up in Maine, and they have that kind of that, that hybrid schedule. Um, and so I see my nephews who are up there. They go to school two days a week, and then they have to interact with a completely different group of kids in the uh, their Y their YMCA uh, daycare, basically because the parents work, so they have to put them into a different kind of setting. Um, you know, and then you know, and then uh, you know, the, I think the the I think they have like a grandparent or something like that, which then exposes the the, the older generation uh, for that one day a week that they have to get somebody else, right? And uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, so actually not being in school might actually be a driver uh, because it forces children to interact with even more students than what they would have to, assuming that they have working parents, right? Which, which many children do. You know, very few children, I guess, have the luxury of a, of a stay-at-home parent, right? And uh, so, yeah, so, of course, when you talk about death for seniors, I mean, at what point does, uh, you know, at what point do do having or at what point does forcing uh, grandparents or older, right, older generations to take care of the kids at home, and what role does that play in these kinds of numbers? I don't know. I mean, these are things that is going to have to get sorted out. Um, per capita mortality. Uh, this is kind of just looking at the, the narrative, right? The narrative. 
So on January 19th, death rate accelerates U.S. records 400,000 lives lost to the coronavirus. And then the next day, right, uh, current uh, W U.S. coronavirus surge has peaked, researchers said. Right. So how has the mood of reporters changed on this kind of stuff? Um, I'm just going to kind of pick up the pace a little bit. It's kind of interesting, right, for, for um, you know, for to, to kind of cross-reference how the media portrayed hospitalizations and, uh, you know, and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And then look at 2020 and then start making comparisons to running three-year averages. It's kind of an interesting way to look at it. Um, I was going to find this one interesting. <laughs> That's just a meme, though. So let's kind of move on from that. Um, use of mask 14 days before illnesses during the month of July. Right. So you kind of get into uh, the mask effectiveness here. All right. And uh, this is a uh, you know the CDC published um, you know the the infection fatality rates. So how deadly is what is the mortality rates for COVID-19 by demographic? Um, we can see it for school age right here. Um, we can see it for under 50 here and kind of going through. So you can definitely see where where the concern right starts to rise. Uh, this is actually a meme I made because um, we were following these uh, quarantine protocols, uh, the six foot one, and this is before I you know, before I went to the COVID shuffle, uh, the first the first uh, phone call I got from my principal, um, I had one kid who came up with COVID. And he knocked out six kids for two weeks. Um, <laughs> you know, so so when one student knocked out six kids for two weeks, um, and of course the kid who who had it, uh, you know, came back uh, <laughs> came back a week later. Um, so anyway, after that phone call, um, and after having to say goodbye to to uh, seven students, right? Because one student had it, took out six. Um, you know, I created this meme and uh, I actually emailed it to my principal. Um, and then I re reconfigured my class into a two one two configuration, and and we played the COVID shuffle, you know, for the next few months. So anyway, my own personal meme. Uh, our our county was pretty transparent. I actually kind of have to commend the level of transparency that our county did have with, with COVID-19. Of course, the New York Times was was really happy to call out um, school districts that were not being as transparent. And this is actually a New York Times article criticizing um, the school district to the south of us, right? our neighboring school district. So, all right. Uh, of course, I bought, um, you know, I bought masks. Uh, to give out to, uh, to students, I paid 150 bucks for those things. Um, I, this is this is what I have left. I'm down to my last box. I've got a uh, I've got three three packages left. Uh, my wife had picked those up at I think Office Depot or something like that this summer. Um, those things are expensive. That was 150 bucks right there. <laughs> no joke. Um, right, this is just kind of news coming out from the summertime. Right, July. Um, I, I also mentioned that uh, you know that the, the, the Today Show, um, where all the where the five the five pediatricians were on, and, and they asked, "Would you you know would you send your children to school?" Um, you know, and every single one of those pediatricians said, "Yes, we would without hesitation." Um, you know, and, and the reason why they would is because the science was pretty clear. Um, you know, back in back then. Um, however, that didn't stop this kind of uh, this kind of stuff from being published in the newspapers. This is not a meme that was created on social media. This is an actual cartoon that was published in a, in a newspaper, right? So the kind of fear mongering that happened in the in the summer of 2020, right? And obviously it was effective because we <laughs> yesterday you still have Chicago teachers who are threatening to to strike and. You know, because they have to go back to teach uh, their kids. Um, you know, what was what was really clear in the summer of 2020, right? After you know, after three months of of distance learning, um, for any of us who who did that, right? What was very very clear is that distance learning works for kids who have very involved parents and kids who are extremely self disciplined. Right, regular school works for them. Distance learning works for them. Students who struggled 
um, you know, in the, you know, in the traditional classroom, um, struggle much, much worse, right? And when you start breaking down, and I'm assuming academics in the future are going to start breaking down the, the, the demographics of the students um, who struggled the worst during this whole virtual thing. Um, I know some, some information came out about this. Uh, I think it was Fairfax County, Virginia, um, about the number of failures, the right? number of Fs broken down uh, by, by racial and ethnic demographics. Um, and it was pretty damning. There was a pretty damning uh, article that came out about it. And that was in the fall. Um, and of course, I believe that resulted in them changing their grading policies, right? So I mean, you can't have a, a black guy like that again if you don't allow your teachers to hold their students accountable. So, I mean, there's a, there was a whole bunch of things that were apparent, right? That, you know, the kids who are successful, right, are, are kids who are very supportive parents at home, generally speaking, um, you know, or just kids who are kind of that, that percentage of students, which we all have that percentage of students, um, that 10 to 20% of students are pretty self-motivated. Um, you know, as far as the rest, right, as far as the rest, um, distance learning has been a challenge, right? It's been a challenge, um, regardless of, of race and ethnicity and, and uh, socioeconomic background, right? That said, I think your, your low socioeconomic background students, so, you know, lack of technology at home, lack of consistent internet access, there's some very real issues, which, you know, which you would think would be a major driver in why students, uh, why teachers would be 100% the driver behind schools opening fast, right? So, uh, and of course, everything else that has kind of come out since, uh, the increase in, in suicide rates and, and all that kind of stuff, it's all very shocking, right? So anyway, but we had a lot of this stuff. Um, I've got actually a ton of memes um, about this that are just like shocking, like just how you know, how kind of embarrassing, you know, they, they were that people were posting this kind of stuff. But I don't want to do the memes because, you know, they're, uh, they're, they are political in nature. So let's, let's so I, I, I try to stay away from the memes. All right, uh, this is a, a photograph I took from March. So I'm just going to jump back from the summer now. Uh, March 19th, right? So you know, for those of you who did the shopping in your house, you're probably familiar with this, right? So this is actually the pasta aisle. Uh, the bread aisle, right? Um, you know, I, I know for uh, for me, this was this is kind of was a, a shocking thing when I saw this um, that the CDC or that the U.S. federal government had gone into the the actual marketplace and started to uh, redirect orders. Of course, now there's actually information out there that the Chinese government um, may have been doing this kind of stuff much sooner. Um, you know, and in, uh, in, in even having individuals in the United States buy buyout supplies in the United States. Um, so, but I, I guess I did put a couple of memes. I did find a couple of memes that were non-political. Um, <laughs> so uh, here's the uh, the academy, right? Uh, this zooming was fun. Uh, see, this kind of stuff is fun for us because. Um, you know, we've been back to normal here for so very long, um, but I would uh, I would imagine that a uh, <laughs> good history one there. Um, I would imagine. Oh, yeah, I always kind of like this one. Um, so somebody came up. This is on March twenty first. Someone came up with this. Uh, the two thousand fifty uh, AP U.S. History free response question. <laughs> Zoom memes for self quarantines twenty twenty. Me and my parents arguing over an answer choice while we're all taking my midterm. Um, <laughs> and then there's that. So this is your stimulus. And then you have your, your, your SAQ prompts here. Um, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Right? Whoever, whoever came up with that one there. Um, you know, so, so these things are kind of funny, I guess, for, for us who, uh, you know, so we, we had to do this for a few weeks, really. Um, you know, but I would imagine... For, uh, for for parents who still have children at home, even two day a week, um, which I can't even wrap my mind around, right? But but I guess there's, you know, obviously reading that Chicago thing, there's still students who aren't back to school yet. Um, I would imagine this meme is no longer that funny. 
Um, you know, it's it's funny for us because it was only a couple of weeks, but ugh, God help them, right? All right, good. Uh, I mean, this is kind of look at these dates on these things, by the way. Um, you know, these are these are quick, and you know, these things are being created really, really fast. Um, yeah, so this is March nineteenth. I don't have a date on this one, so I'm guessing it's right around uh, the 15th or 14th or so. Uh, this is March 2nd, this one. I always kind of like this one. I actually sent this one myself to a, <laughs> to a, uh, a family member of my wife's. So good stuff. All right, March 2nd. All right. All right, uh, so that's about it. All right, so when you kind of look at the history of pandemics, I actually screenshotted this back in, uh, it's probably a date on here, March 11th. Um, I screenshotted this kind of looking at at the, the, the novel coronavirus back when there were 4,000, 4.7 global deaths. Um, but this is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting website. Um, it looks at the history of pandemics. And it's kind of a cool infographic, good way of kind of looking at history. Uh, they actually got a lot of great stuff on this website as far as infographics are concerned. Um, you know, and it kind of just shows you. You know, uh, you know how many people you know were affected, impacted by uh, this. So today, right, the number has now gone up. Uh, so this is the real time: two point seven million global deaths, um, up from four point seven thousand uh, just over a year ago. Right, so just over a year ago. All right, so uh, anyway, so these are just some screenshots that I pulled off from that site. Um, you know, so you're, you're welcome to kind of stop and have a quick look at that. Um, this right here is looking at, uh, you know, transmission, right? Transmission of these. And, of course, look at measles, right? Look at measles. <laughs> you know, uh, a measure of how many people each sick person will infect on average. So let's see what you got here. 17 people in the group, right? How many will be? Is that right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So if there are 17 people in the group, um, one person walks into the room with it, right? Then 16 out of the 17 will will come down with it. This is why we often hear about measles outbreaks in you know in uh, California. Um, you know there'll be somebody from a developing country where measles is still uh, you know, has not been eradicated. You know they'll come to a place like Disneyland. You know they'll come into contact with children from the west coast of the United States. Um, anti-vaxxer parents who have not had the not had allowed their children to have the NMR, and then all of a sudden you've got a measles outbreak. Um, you know, so you do hear about this in the United States every once in a while. So, but uh, you know, transmission is massive, right? Massive. I don't really know what this is today. Um, um, this is this was back a year ago, right? What we thought, what we thought. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that, that, that's influenza. That's not COVID. I guess they don't have COVID. Um, all right, so anyway, uh, let's just kind of run through really quick uh, Spanish flu, right? So Spanish flu, feel free to pause and read through. I don't need to read this to you. Um, feel free to pause and read through, right? You kind of look at why the Spanish flu is such a big deal. 50 to 100 million dead, right? 50 to 100 million dead. 50 is the low ball number, right? So, you know, uh, will COVID-19 match up? See the Spanish influenza? Probably, probably not, right? If you look at these as well, right? You know, this is kind of like what we're seeing with COVID-19 though. You know, depending upon where you are in the world, it's not affecting all countries in the same way. You know, so there's all kinds of variables at play. Um, you know, as I kind of said before, I think we need to really deep dive. You know, I think future academics in this country need to really uh, dive deep into why, you know, and actually get answers so that when these pandemics happen again in the future, um, you know, we have actual strategies based on demographic realities and climate realities and geographic realities um, that, you know, that are going to be effective, right? But uh, there we go. So you can see many of the same many of the same debates okay um yeah so this is something that <laughs> i actually pulled this uh I, I pulled this a year ago um so this came out 
right? This came out um, from the Washington Post uh, about a year ago, back when people first started talking about social distancing. And I personally had never heard of social distancing before, um, but the argument that was being made here by the Washington Post is that with the 1918 flu, you know, the the speed in which social distancing was um, you know was put into place impacted impacted the the rates the cases um you know so i don't i don't know this is one of those things where research is gonna have to be done so maybe there is a lot of truth to this right so you know countries that took quick decisive action um i mean maybe we're gonna have to look at the data and just see in in uh, with COVID 19 whether or not that was true or not um right so the claim being made here, right, um, in this, right, in this uh, article, um, is saying it makes a massive difference, right? Major, major difference. So when you talk about social distancing, you talk about flattening the curve, right? You're not actually talking about, you know, these two numbers. The total number might be the same later on, but you do not overwhelm hospital capacity. Right, so that you give everyone the best possible chance of being able to survive uh, the disease. All right. Um, as far as this other stuff, I think these are fascinating videos. Um, so I'm going to put these onto the website. You know, links for these onto the website. Um, you know, because and, and I'm just say personally, I think there's nothing scarier in in the world uh, than than polio. Um, so this this great video on educational video on polio has now eventually been taken down by the copyright thing. So I'll, I guess I'm not going to put that on my website. I wonder if the Fleming one did. All right. Oh, very nice. Uh, actually, that's simply because of how I'm logged in. So let me uh, switch that account. Let me go to my school account, not my not my personal one. Okay, so th this one's good. This one's good. So, so I'll, I'll put that on my website. Um, all right, so as far as vaccines are concerned, right, here's kind of a little rundown on vaccines. Please feel free to please pause and, and kind of read through that real quick. We've already kind of talked about this. All right, uh, prevalence of polio rates in the United States. Um, this is an amazing, right, amazing success story for vaccines. Um, and I will say, you know, obviously most Americans know about polio because of, of FDR. Um, I will say that, you know, my, my best friend growing up, um, you know, uh, his dad, John, um, had, you know, was kind of one of the last cases of polio, um, you know, and, uh, and of course he was, he was fortunate uh, that he had only lost, uh, lost use of one of his arms. Um, but, you know, when I kind of look at polio, I guess because I did personally know someone who, who had it. Uh, as a child, you know, this is a, this is an extremely scary one because of the demographics that it impacts, All right? Uh, the number of reported, uh, you know, paralysis, polio cases in the world, right? We see, uh, you know, we, we see it, you know, being eradicated in the United States, but it is still very much real in the world, right? So just because we have vaccines for it doesn't mean, uh, doesn't mean the entire world has access to those vaccines. Um, however, you know, obviously the WHO and the United Nations themselves have done a much kind of very impressive job after the 1980s, you know, when it comes to global health initiatives. All right. All right. So that's about it for today. I'm sure I went crazy long today. I'm really sorry. Uh, so, some key takeaways. Disease associated with poverty continues to impact the developing nations of Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Better nutrition, education, political stability, key meds, stability, medical treatments in the developed world have enabled humans to live longer, resulting in increased prevalence of diseases associated with aging. And emergent epidemic diseases continue to be a regional and global threat despite the presence of the WHO and medical technology. All right, that is all for today. Sapriati.